Welcome everybody. Lauren, do you want me to make a start? Excellent, thank you. So welcome everyone. I've got the post-lunch session, so um, hopefully you've had a, a nice quick break. I'm Julie Davis. I'm the um, Deputy Chief Operating Officer for the Clinical Research Network here in the West Midlands. Um, I'm also the wellbeing lead for the network and I'm the creator of the Doing Our Bit Fitness platform, which we'll go through a little bit later, but it's one of the initiatives that I launched during, during lockdown. So just to give you a bit of an idea about how we um, went about rolling out the program to try and improve the employee and sort of people experience. Um, I've got a couple of slides, so I will share my screen. Um, hopefully the technology will be kind. So, so hopefully you can you can all see those now. So basically, the the, the initiatives we wanted to um, look at in the West Midlands, we wanted to try and motivate our staff, keep them creative, and make whatever we did sustainable and engaging, so suitable for the sort of pre-lockdown world and also the the post one. So today it's just looking at really the ambition of what we wanted to try and achieve the outcome, the spread, the value, and how we involved partners and sort of the crucial collaborators in what we've done. Um, the bit on the right hand side is all the awards that we've either won. So the HPMA one, thank you very much. The Bevan Britain Award for Wellbeing. Um, but we've also gone in for a few where we've been shortlisted as well. And bearing in mind the wellbeing initiatives that have been launched during lockdown have been amazing. So even to get shortlisted for some of those has been really um, uplifting for us and the team. So in terms of ambition, we wanted to focus on wellbeing in the workplace during lockdown, obviously. Um, but what made that a little bit more difficult during the pandemic was that we had staff that were deployed left, right and centre and um, they were working on shifts. Some staff were just literally sent home in March with a laptop. Um, and I think what we needed to do is make sure that everything we did was accessible for all and that staff, for me, equity of access is one of the most important parts of this. Um, but also just because the staff weren't frontline, we really wanted to try and get them to see the part that they played in the pandemic. So in terms of, sort of increasing their job satisfaction and things. So what we wanted to do was have this pick and mix of wellbeing workshops. So you don't have to, you know, tune into everything. It's very much what you like, what makes you motivated on a daily basis with your wellbeing and make sure that the network was still a place where people wanted to come to work, had a good day and how we had to work out how we supported them to make sure that we, we offered them that opportunity. So the outcomes after a few months of wellbeing initiatives, we've done some staff surveys um, and we've done quite a lot of assessing of what we were offering because we had an amazing um, wellbeing programme pre-lockdown um, and we just had to make sure we changed it all up really, really quickly, again, as everyone had to, um, as the world sort of went virtual. So we wanted to make our staff engaged and empowered. So we've really listened to them. We've enlisted champions. Um, and what we wanted to try and do as well is make sure that staff took a bit of responsibility for their own self-care and their own sort of health improvements, because one of the challenges which we'll come on to was we probably did a little bit too much, if we're being honest. We started spoon feeding staff and we made them very reliant on what was offered by us as a wellbeing team. Um, but some of the comments have been great. We run a menopause workshop where people described it as life changing. And to get that sort of feedback is heartwarming, really. It makes you realise why you do what you do. The staff satisfaction survey during lockdown, I was really impressed that we still got really good results. Um, our staff were deployed in a lot of organisations not involved with the network at all. It was just literally where the, the need was in terms of frontline staff. But we still had 92% saying they felt part of the, our team, 86% um, rated the programme was very good or good. And it was just then we knew we've got a little bit of work to do in terms of making it a little bit more accessible. We covered loads of virtual workouts um, to cover physical, emotional and psychological wellness. We had weekly fitness sessions um, and then the, the wellbeing workshops tended to be monthly. So we covered topics like resilience, 
isolation and loneliness, power of positivity when everyone was feeling a little bit down. And what we wanted to do was to link back into sort of the staff being engaged and taking responsibility. We now do some of our sessions are co-delivered by our wellbeing champions that are just normal staff day in, day out. And that's worked really good. So the whole point was to create this inclusive program for all that no matter where you work, you had access to this, no matter whether you're on wards, on deployment, stuck at home. Um, and then we wanted to try and make sure that we shared those stories through personal blogs. So the challenges, I suppose, um, and this is where I think some of you will be having exactly the same issues. Um, we, we're quite a big network. So if we take geography first, we're a big network. We cover a region from Hereford right up to sort of North Staffordshire and Stoke. So I think apparently it's about the same size as Scotland. So if we put a workshop on in one organisation, that doesn't work for everybody. So actually going virtual worked for us really, really well. And moving into version 3.0 of our wellbeing strategy, um, I think we'll start to really look at the hybrid model and see whether we can get some people back face to face, but traveling for two and a half hours for an hour's wellbeing workshop just isn't worth it. So I think the hybrid model will work really well. So a challenge that was given to us, we can turn that around now with everybody being a bit more virtual. Time is always a difficult one. People don't class it as the core day job, but actually, I think the one thing we have learned during lockdown is staff, they're our most precious resource. So I think we need to um, link this with the management one next and managers need to take that responsibility of having a bit of duty of care towards their staff and getting them to make sure they protect some time. Um, I, I'm guilty of it myself. Sometimes I'll put in to attend a wellbeing workshop and something else will come up and that's the first thing that goes, but actually we need to be really strict with it and we need to be strict with our own time and those that we line manage. Um, cost is always seen as a bit of a barrier, but actually we ran all the workshops last year, um, sorry, the year pre-COVID, um, and they worked out as per head, we spent £25 per member of staff, which is a really, really low cost. But you can be quite innovative in how you deliver some of the sessions and who you bring in. I think what has happened over the last couple of years is that you mentioned the word well-being and consultants put zero on the end of things that so we can really look towards um, the smaller businesses. And I think that's great to have local partnerships as well. Um, and then accessibility. We have those frontline staff that are um, deployed. Um, they're not on emails all day like the more office based workers are. So we need to make it more accessible to them. So actually what we've tried to start doing is explain how some of our initiatives are for home and work life balance. It's not just these aren't just topics that help you out at work, but that they look at um, equity of access and how you can access to so say like podcasts and things like that, that actually while they're on their commute, they could listen to them. Um, so it's being creative again in how you access those. And culture is a huge one, but I think we're really getting there as, a, as an employer now. We had people right at the beginning that says, oh, you do that pink and fluffy stuff, don't you? When they were talking about well-being. COVID has given us that opportunity to show how important well-being is because I think all of a sudden people turned around and sort of looked at how stressful life can be in the NHS and beyond. So I think that's really changed. So those were the challenges and probably how we overcame them a little bit. I think pre-COVID, the challenges were the same, but the post-COVID world or while we're still in it, um, we can work through those. And I think there are so many more solutions. So if we look at the spread um, this year, we've had 93% of our staff participating in a wellbeing initiative during the pandemic. I'll come on to the NHS overall number there, which is doing our bit fitness platform, which is now reaching 630,000 staff. And we've got our plans for partners. So what we want to do is create a bit of an R&D community, a research and development community across the region where all of our um, research fellows, research nurses are invited into what the network put on. So we don't they, we don't fund them. Um, but we do feel they're part of our sort of regional community. So we will be looking at that. And I think that's quite exciting in terms of plans for the future. And then the value of it, why we do it. Absence reduction is one measure. And I wanted to come on to how people 
think that you can measure the success of a wellbeing programme without it just being about absence reduction. But this is a huge one for us. So our absence went down from 4.2% to 2.45 in that year. Um, mental health related absence went down and musculoskeletal by around 40%, 40 to 45% on each of those. And when you look at the cost of that, we only have 180 staff in our network. When you look at the cost of that, we saved £80,000 in sort of lost days to work. Um, so that's a nice one for the, the financy people. Um, when you look at, can we afford to invest some money, <coughs> excuse me, in wellbeing, you look at the savings in other areas and actually lower costs and less time at the office because you are looking virtual. Um, it's definitely equitable now. Um, all staff have got access. This is Pauline Boyle, who is our Chief Operating Officer. She, during the pandemic, despite being the Chief Operating Officer and trying to get the network to carry on running, she went into wards to recruit patients into COVID treatment studies, um, but still made sure that she attended wellbeing things and really changed that culture um, and inclusion during uh, the the difficult couple of months um, right at the beginning. So I think that helps. It made it equitable because we had buy-in right from the top. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the impact. This last picture is Maddie. She's one of our um, younger research recruits. Um, she's amazing. And this is why we do what we do. We do it because if we keep our staff happy and healthy, they can look after our patients and they can look after people like Maddie. And at the end of the day, the patient is always at the centre of what we do. <coughs> so um, in terms of working together, I think there's a lot that can be done around staff engagement levels and levels of patient satisfaction. So we can prove that it is essential to patient wellbeing, even though we're concentrating on our staff. So I've put some sort of facts and figures in here around the impact and some quotes on the impact that the workers had. And also um, the fact that we had, even though we've got 180 staff, we had 2,228 attendances at wellbeing workshops or um, workouts during the year, which is amazing. It just showed that we had a number of people that were unique visitors, but actually people just kept coming back, which is what we wanted it to do. That shows that we it's working. And then in terms of reach, we wanted to, we've got the hashtags no going back and changing for the best. We need to learn from what COVID has brought to um, the research networks and the NHS as a whole and capitalise on that really. Look for the positives, look at where we can expand and make staff more self-sufficient and engage them and support them. So there are massive opportunities for working together across boundaries, across regions and departments. So then just over to you, I suppose, and I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because I can see the chat then. Um, but there's a couple of things that we wanted to look at, and this is to get your advice and to have a bit of a Q&A session on how people think that wellbeing can be seen as a core business in the people function. Um, it's always been a bit of an add on and actually speaking to, because we have 25 trusts in our region under our network. Um, it doesn't sit in the same place in all of those organisations. And actually, I think sometimes it's just got a name against it. And I think things are changing and they're changing for the better. But it's how we get that to be seen as a core business function. Um, whether anybody's got any ideas for measures and impacts that we could share. Um, and also, what does wellbeing look like for the future? What's needed and how has, how has it changed? So if I stop sharing for a second... So can, uh, can people, am I back in the room? <laughs> so thank you. So if we look at then core business, has anybody got any questions or advice or anything like that on how how they've managed to get wellbeing seen as a core business um, function or have they got any issues at the moment with trying to do that in their organisation? So if you could, if you could pop the um, questions in the Q&A section. And I'll just give that a minute. So I think what our trust is the Royal Wolverhampton Trust that sort of hosts the network. Um, 
and it sits under organisational developing there, but it does have links into obviously occupational health. But we're really lucky that our chief executive is huge on wellbeing. Um, and I think that makes a difference. So if you have got buy-in at the top, I think that is a key to getting the wellbeing initiatives rolled out more effectively, quicker, and having that support and the backing and probably the finances as well to put some of the programmes in place. So has anybody got anything that they wanted to share in terms of core business? Just check the chat. Um, so if we if we move on to the measures and the impacts, like I said, we looked at the um, the staff absence rates, and we do we ask for feedback and we ask for testimonials. And those are great. So we have a bit of a quantitative and a qualitative element to the measurement of how it works. Um, but again, it's what else measures whether something's working or whether you need to change up your wellbeing programme. So again, has anybody got any any ideas, anything that's worked really well in their, their organisations in terms of measurement? If you have, if you can pop it in the in the Q and A, don't there's any. <clears throat> so I think there was um, a couple of years ago when I was at a public health conference. This came up, and I think it must have been five or six years ago, and there still wasn't very much of an idea then, and there isn't now in how you can look at it. We are going very much on the number of people attending um, and the percentage of our workforce that we're reaching. We do have what some organisations call hard to reach groups. So whether that's about equity of access or just an interest in wellbeing, really, I think that's um, always something to, to, to look at. If you can measure the demographics of your staff, that's great. Are you missing a certain element? So we ran a men's health event online um, during Men's Health Week, I think it was in June. And it was great. The numbers weren't huge, but actually data and research shows that men might not access live sessions um, for a number of different reasons. But I, I think that wellbeing is a, is a much more difficult topic for men. So we have put those on and actually the number, once we've put them onto a site and people can access it afterwards, the number of um, views on those videos just kept going up and up. So there are different measures as well that we can look at in terms of your workforce and, and who's accessing it. Um, so if I look at Amy, um, Amy said, we look at some basic data such as access to our wellbeing internet pages and downloads of our pack. And this is maintained over a period of time. That's, that's great. I think that there are different um, capabilities in different packages that we'd love to be able to do some of that. We use Google Sites, which doesn't, give you amazing data um but I like the downloads so I will steal that I'll see if we can we can work out something around the downloads um I don't know Amy whether you want to add anything else or come in on that one so just pop your hand up if you do um and so I think that if we're reaching those staff and they are downloading it even if they're not turning up to a session in person or online I think that's you know that's what we need that's what the job that we're here to do um, anything else around any measurements anything else we can measure that we should be so if we moved on to what is needed in the future what does the future of well-being look like we'll obviously i'm sure a number of organizations will start looking at hybrid sessions um, are there any topics that people would like to share that they they think is more important in the the new world? Um, I think that we we are looking at a lot of work around coaching and trying to keep remote teams working more creatively. I think that's a huge issue um, now that people are working away from a shared office. How you can keep that team spirit going. So that will be a big point for us in the future. Um, 
flexible working absolutely uh i think with flexible working there are so many you're never going to please everybody and things have changed massively around this in the last year and a half um we did have initially right at the beginning people wanted to work from home and then suddenly then everybody wanted to come back to the office and now we're trying to implement this hybrid thing it's almost like you can't please everybody so we need to try and make sure that all the topics that you would normally have in team meetings in your water cooler moments so to speak are, are bought bought into that so um i don't know amy is that you that's mentioned about the flexible working i don't know whether there's any certain topics that are uh, or issues around flexible working that you wanted to concentrate on let's give you a second to type in there So we can we'll come back to that if Amy has um can pop that in. So if I start resharing again, um, and then I can show you the rest of the the program that we're looking at. So post COVID, I I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but you know routines went out the window. Staff were burnt out, tired, and stressed exhausted and actually very demotivated during this time um we had a lot of self-isolation cases and we wanted to do something about the sickness rates and the fact that people were working in isolation um, and not being able to access anything that kept them from being sedentary especially the ones that were working from home suddenly you're, you're sitting down all day so the new world made it impossible for us to continue with what we were doing. We weren't virtual, but we wanted to future proof it as well um, and learn lessons from the pandemic, spread some positivity and really do the sort of quality improvement part of well-being to show that well-being and welfare um, is paramount. We've brought welfare into our well-being initiatives a lot over the last six months because I think I think it encompasses a little bit more around what's needed in the NHS. So it is just it is a lot about welfare as well as well-being. So we knew there was a need for action. I, I've got a, um, a passion for physical activity um, and I wanted to try and see how we could carry on doing physical activity initiatives during lockdown. And actually, we were working in a period where the community wanted to show their appreciation as well. We had the clapping on a Thursday. Everyone wanted to do their bit in volunteering in somehow um, to help the NHS through it. So we came up with a fitness platform. Um, it started in my kitchen with my husband doing sessions. And suddenly, you know, a year later, we're opening 110 NHS organisations, oh, yeah. reaching 600,000 people. Um, and the impact that this has had on people is is great i think it's our opportunity to give back to the nhs and the social care community um for all their efforts so the strap line i suppose for doing our bit which is the name of the fitness platform is that it was created by the nhs for the nhs and it's free forever so this will, will never will never change so it was one great idea. We had three partners involved. And again, it was bringing in those organisations that can that are on the same wavelength as you. Um, we now have 43 passionate PTs on the, on the site. There's 60 workouts. We have 20,000 active NHS users at any one time. And we can reach over 600,000 staff. Now, the difficulty is, and we'll come to this again at the end, is it's great, it's not easy. Um, an NHS organisation will sign up to the fitness platform and maybe send a, a group email around. It's the ongoing engagement for us and how we keep reminding people that is the um, area that we want to get better at. And this is done in everybody's own time. So the three reputable partners that we've got, which I'll mention later, um, and myself, this isn't our day job. So we do it all in our time. It's us giving our bit back to the NHS as well. So that's why rollout probably could be faster if we had a dedicated team behind it. So we've been, I've mentioned that we've been shortlisted for a few awards. We're endorsed by the United by Birmingham 2022 project for the Commonwealth Games, which recognises grassroots projects um, that help out the community. We've had a lot of PR and the, it, 
it is that element of it's created by the NHS for the NHS. It was so difficult initially to get people to understand that actually this was free. I kept saying, so once the free trial's over, um, how much does it cost after that? And it, it, you know, it's always been that this will be free forever. Um, all the workouts are quality assured and they, everybody that does a workout for us has to wear the Doing Our Bit t-shirts. There's no upselling in this either. It's not a commercial venture. It will always be very much NHS based. So this is what the platform looks like. Um, there's six different sections on there for different levels of activity. And um, like I said, there's around 60 workouts on there. Um, and we've got an education section as well that covers nutrition, hydration, motivation. We've got some menopause um, information in there as well, because that is huge in workforces across the UK. There's also sessions that you can do with your family as well. So it's, it's quite nice to do those. And then I think um, I'm going to just try and play this video. Um, which was created by um, Belfast and it just really shows it's about two minutes long so we'll stop it if it gets a bit too long but I think it really shows the impact that um, initiatives like this can have. So our staff have gone the extra mile for the last year through the pandemic and their response has been phenomenal in terms of their commitment to professionalism and the hard work that they've shown. We've introduced a number of initiatives um, across the sites to try and support staff through these challenging times, recognising that staff don't just work here, they also have home lives, the pressure of homeschooling, the lockdown and the impact of lockdown, all of that creates an environment where there's additional stress and anxiety for staff. It's all work and no play, uh, it doesn't help people. It uh, impacts adversely on their physical and their mental health. Exercise is an excellent way of overcoming that. Most important thing is looking after the staff because if the staff are sick, they're not able to deliver service. They've delivered fantastically over the last year. It's now our job to make sure that we do everything to support them to get over this and to keep them fit, healthy and happy. We're delighted that we're now taking part in the Doing Our Bit initiative which will help support staff with their physical health by giving them access to online fitness programs, which they can access at no cost in their own time. I suppose if you recognise the impact of gyms closed and the lack of opportunities for people to do their normal exercise routines, this is a fantastic way that staff can do it. It's great to see that so many NHS organisations are coming together to provide this service for all ages and all abilities throughout the online platform that people can do at home. Having that opportunity to physically exercise is well proven to improve mental health and having the time just of your own choosing to do what you want to do to improve your fitness, I think will be a great support for staff as we continue through this period. The trust is always it innovative in what it does and we've led the way over many years in various different things. I see this as the first step to a program of total health and wellbeing. Eat the bullet, eat the frog, whatever way you want to call it, um, just start it. Um, start off nice and gently. Don't be trying to rush in and doing what the instructor um, at the high level is doing. Break yourself in, take your breaks, get a rest in between. Don't be afraid to hit pause, get your break. Um, take a second, get a drink of water, and then move on with it again. Nobody ever regrets doing a workout. It's just that next up part of getting it done at the start. So I think that should have stopped sharing that. So I, I love that video because I think it shows enthusiasm for an initiative um, in an organisation. Um, if we can, if we could have everybody like that, it'd be amazing. So in Kevin's words, bite the bullet, eat the frog. I think we need to get people, more people signed up. So what I can do is before I go through the rest of the presentation, um, I will put my details in the chat as well. So if people wanted to contact me about the platform or to have a look at the website itself, then you can do that in your, your own time. So final sharing screen now. I'm impressed this is working so far. So we've, we've got um, a lot of testimonials on the site we have. And I think what the ones that are really, really good are the ones that are from sort of physios and the health professionals themselves that have tried out the sessions and tried it with their staff. So this is Matt. He's from Swansea Bay. 
um, University Hospital Health Board and he's shared it with his 12,500 employees um, because he's a physio, his part of his role is health promotion. So that's sort of one element. We've got Izzy, who is a community health visitor um, that has been using it as an individual herself and she's been using it with her family, which is um, really encouraging. And there's a picture of her in the gym there. She's actually left the gym and she does the sessions on, on the uh, platform. And we have uh, Stephanie, who is a health improvement advisor. Um, she's really enthusiastic and she's been a real driver for us behind this because she can see the positive benefits that have happened to people in her organisation from becoming more active. Um, they had 95 colleagues accessing the uh, virtual activities with them, with many of them being new to exercise, which is exactly what we want. I think there's it is easier to preach the converted in terms of physical activity and well-being but if you get those new people coming in that's the that's the element that's really encouraging and really rewarding and then i suppose looking forward as well i think what's helped us promote this more has been some good pr so i would suggest as well you get in touch with your comms team if you are trying to roll out well-being initiatives um i hate being on camera i've been on bbc news um the local news loads of radio and print publications there's a few on there then a lot of fitness related journals as well um just clicking through so you can see sort of scope and then midlife fitness files which i was a bit unsure about but this was in the De uh, daily telegraph and and this was a real opportunity as well for us to um, promote the platform on a national scale and the reasons why why we did it as well. So I suppose in terms of involvement, we've we've mentioned that a little bit. Collaborators are crucial. We got small local companies and individuals to help with our local wellbeing initiatives. And then for doing our bit, we got some of the fitness um, leaders, I suppose, where Fibre do, Study Active and Active IQ. Um, Active P Action PR do all the PR work for it. And Hackett Health and Fitness is the is the company my husband worked for that actually did the, he did the workouts for the first eleven weeks of lockdown. Um, and I'm hoping to get him on the platform at some point as well soon. Uh, we've got NHS employers are really up for it, and again, there are so many like-minded individuals on the NHS employers um, working groups and on their Facebook groups. So I would encourage you all to engage with that as well and really have a chat with other people that have rolled out initiatives there um, and then regional collaborative so men's health day we ran with three of our local trusts and actually it was a national day um, and then we can use those regional collaboratives to drive national initiatives um, and a couple of the other partners there albion foundation and everton in the community um, are on board and they're both football clubs with huge community level um, charities associated with them and their staff have done workouts for us as well that enables us then to get into that area so in liverpool we did a lot of media around it because everton were involved so that got us more of the liverpool um, organizations on board so the partnerships, as I've mentioned, Fibre do, who are the, the platform providers, they wanted to do their bit to give, um, to like provide a robust system that we could upscale as the demand grows during our, I suppose, during our, doing our bit journey, which it is. So we are looking at live sessions coming soon, hopefully, and um, Fibre do are driving that. Study Active help us, it, it's their gift, I suppose, to the NHS. They help us try and find all the PTs that would be willing to come and work on the platform um, again for free and Active IQ, uh, the sort of quality integrity part of it. They've got an external verifying team who step up and they share their expertise and um, they check every single second of every video that's on there. So actually when it goes out to NHS staff, we know it's safe for them to be doing it. So then just for the last five minutes, it was again, can you help us with the next level of doing our bit or can you advise on anything physical activity related? How do we get buy-in? So at the moment, I'm struggling to get NHS level buy-in. Trust level is a little bit easier, but the um, interest wanes. And then how do you get access to the staff who might not see the uh, posts that might go out on the monthly bulletin? 
Um, I love this picture I've always of this one for equality and equity. How do we get equity of access? So just if we just send it out to everybody in the NHS, that's not going to reach the people that need it. So we've had organisations come back to us and say, well, our porters don't even have NHS email addresses. So how can we get the wellbeing messages out to those people apart from, you know, a few posters on a few boards? Um, and for the next level of doing our bit, what would make it stand out more? Um, how can we make this really popular, really um, aligned with our staff that we want to reach? So I will stop sharing again and see if there are any um, messages in the chat. But so. So Amy, just going back to um, the women's health strategy, um, like I said, we're doing a lot around menopause as well. And if you are doing anything like this, and I don't know if any, everybody's on the NHS Employers Work Facebook group, but there's so much information on there that can be shared around, especially around women's health. I agree, it's, it's a huge one. And we're actually writing a bit of a men's strategy as well um, around andropause uh, and working out actually in terms of EDI and gender how that can also link into like the trans community and making sure that we're we're reaching everybody um that we need to so I think that's a really important one um Lauren is the green agenda helping eg reducing car use encouraging cycling to work etc I think it it will do when people go back to the offices um and what we're trying to do as a, an employer at the moment as well is to get people to be a bit more um green while they're working from home so i don't we asked like how many people leave their laptops charging all day every day overnight and things like that and it's just um greenpeace have actually shared something really nice as a hundred tips to being a bit more sustainable in your home so that's a good one to look out but um, encouraging cycling to work is is amazing and I think it's around your EAP program isn't it with um, cycling to work schemes and things like that but linking in with public health to see whether there's any local initiatives we've got cycle lanes everywhere in Birmingham um, and it will be really good when people start going back to the offices more to to be using them um, and then some more comments there around policy process management process sorry policy process management capability attraction development etc linking into well-being through our stress management programs support for carers program yeah uh, again um eap for us the employee assistance programs there's there's often a lot there and sometimes it's just around signposting and making sure those signposting messages are clear i suppose um and offering offering those out um Lauren do you find groups taking a session together of people watching alone at home um a mix of both I think so what we do as a network is we have calendar invites that go out to our staff um between a few sort of core people they pick a workout the calendar invites in they protected times in there and it might be like a four o'clock meeting and it's yoga um or a, a eight o'clock meeting and it uh, and it's high impact just to get you your lively for the day um and there's also the element that you can obviously just do it on your own in your own time we just suggest sometimes people prefer to turn the cameras off but i think if you can do it in small departments where you may have like 20 25 people on that i think it works really well so there's definitely an opportunity to do it to do it both ways um and so I suppose just I think we've got a couple of minutes left. I know it's meant to finish at around 140, 145. But has anybody got any ideas of what would make doing our bit better? Um, are there any areas that you think in terms of physical activity that need covering? We have, I'll sh I will share the link um, because I think there's there's a lot on there, but we, we react very much to what people want. So I had an email from a lady that actually made me cry um 
she was stage four breast cancer and she contacted us and said, I want a better body before I die. Can you help me? Can you tell me which workouts I should be doing at this point? And it's like, if we can make a difference to a couple of people like that. So we, we've, we work with um, a cancer rehab specialist. She's done some sessions that are on the fitness platform and she has agreed that if anybody comes back with really specific areas that they, they need covering, she will do it. So she said she'll do some workouts if people have got catheters or if people are very immobile. We've, we're trying to cover all areas in it. Um, we, we got asked for pre and postnatal, so we've put that on. But we react to the NHS community. This platform is to give the NHS staff what they need and what they want. So I think that's like a huge part for us. Um, so last question then, if anyone has got any tips. The NHS is great at providing reactive um, measures so at the moment and i don't always want to link a, le a low level of physical activity to bmi um because that's not what doing our bit is about it's about just getting you off your off your chair really and and happy and healthy um so they have a bmi program that once your bmi is over 30 i think it is or depending on your um ethnicity it might be a bit lower for other areas and that's great, that's running, it's really well promoted, but there's not really anything in terms of NHS staff that is preventative. So this is preventative, but we haven't managed to get it in front of the, the people at the NHS that could go, right, this, this should be man, almost mandated um, that organisations give their staff access to it. Um, so has anybody got any tips on how we could get more NHS buy-in or trust level buy-in. Anything you've done in your region or trust that might help? Just wait a second for comments. And while I'm just waiting for those comments, I'm going to just grab the, um, the, the website address as well, which I will pop in the chat. So there's a new website coming soon, um, so keep an eye out for it and it will be a bit more singing and dancing. This is just literally a platform at the moment that has, you can register on there and get access, but it's just sort of a, a platform to, to host the um, videos. So the new website will link through to this, but there will be a lot more information, testimonials, videos. Um, when you do join up as an organisation, we've done all of the internal comms for you. So you can just get access to a shared folder. They're all there, all your posters, all your social media graphics, newsletters, everything's done and ready to go. So it's literally just a case of buy-in really. Um, opportunities to link in with some of the older people groups like Restless. We are looking at ensuring that we can meet all the needs in terms of age. Um, and there is one organisation that we've just been in touch with this week, actually. Um, let me just see what it's called. And I think that's a real opportunity for us to, um, again, make sure that the less mobile staff, uh, they, it's not that the other platform we're looking at isn't for NHS staff, but there's definitely experts on there that we could bring into the platform. And that's what we're, we're looking for. Um, new Year resolutions, yeah, absolutely. It's like new me in January. Um, we're doing the 12 days of fitness over the festive period and then really trying to relaunch again in January with the, the New Year's resolutions. And what we are doing as well for January, which will be really exciting, is we are offering um, a level one personal, it's not personal training, but essentially it's level one sort of um, physical activity training courses for people if they want to become doing our bit energizers so it's banging the drum about the platform and physical activity on social media and things like that so I think that's opportunities for people to get a qualification um, if they've got a real interest in physical activity. Um, good reliable nutritional advice absolutely we've got Ben Kuma on the platform um, ben Kuma is amazing. He is a nutritionist 
um, and he's got some tips on there. We've got some tips around nutrition um, and also uh, hydration, which is really important as well. Um, and for those who, this is me sending people away from the platform here, so it's the wrong thing to do, but check out Ben Coomer's podcast. He has got a YouTube channel um, and as Wellbeing Leads, it's a good, they're, they're free, um, but they're good links to be putting in wellbeing newsletters and things like that. Our staff rave about them. And we've just had him do a personal session for our staff around, I suppose, around being organised. You know, a lot of clinical staff know what you should eat, how many, roughly how many calories, what you shouldn't eat. But actually life gets in the way and it's more around the practicalities of eating healthily that he covered. Um, so he's a good one to follow on Instagram. Excellent. Thank you, Pippa. Another registration coming up. And if you want to, if you have got a, um, a well-being, I don't know whether everybody on this is well-being leads, but if you aren't, if you want to pass this on to your well-being leads in your organisations um, and get them to get in touch, then we can we can get them set up. It's literally a Google form with about four questions on saying what your name is, your email address, your organisation and how many staff you've got. And then I send out an email that follows up with all the joining instructions and the shared drive. Um, so it's all there. You can sign up as individuals there as well. We just hope that in, again, equity of access, we get organisations to sign up as well so they can push it for their staff. And I think I've come to the end of my allocated time. I will, just in case people, um, I will pop my email address in again, always happy to take any questions or talk about well-being um, or physical activity. It's never a topic that bores me. And I suppose I should uh, just finish by showing my HBMA award, which is great. Uh, but it's, it's an opportunity to look after your staff and make a difference to them um, and like I said the feedback that we've had from people not only for our well-being initiative but for the platform just makes it worthwhile absolutely thank you very much